<laughs> Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, so you may have noticed that AI is everywhere, um, including at conferences. You are currently here. Uh, there was an AI talk before me and another one after me. Um, and it's starting to show up in all kinds of products, uh, whether you want it to or not. Uh, even Google uh, introduced an AI overview where immediately people were like, I don't want to use Google as an AI overview. I want a list of links that I can go to myself. Uh, and then the AI overview started to go off the deep end a little bit. Um, because apparently it was trained on data from The Onion and Reddit and other places. And honestly, who could have known that training bots and AI on the internet was a bad idea? Um, which is just to say it would be helpful if we learn a little bit from our history. Uh, on the other hand, we, have, we are seeing some very bold claims about uh, AI. One is that it will make us more productive. Uh, lots of uh, claims about that. Second, it will take our jobs. And third, that uh, artificial general uh, intelligence is imminent or already here, which I really hope not because I grew up on Terminator movies. Um, but I want to discuss whether it will actually take our jobs. Um, Holly Cummins wrote a blog post on uh, will AI take our jobs, where she um, explains that new technology has taken jobs before or has made certain jobs disappear. And one of the examples that she uses is the knocker up, which was a person who would stop by people's houses to knock on their windows to make sure that they got up on time to go to work. And this was, of course, before we had uh, alarm clocks or phones or watches to set alarms on. Um, and we, we can think of more jobs that have been automated away. Uh, it used to be the case that we had to light individual lamp posts and now it's all electric. Um, when we go to the supermarket, we can scan our own groceries rather than go through the cashier. I just did so yesterday um, at the supermarket next to the hotel. So that's everywhere as well. Um, but also the claim that tech will take our jobs as developers is not new. We've most recently seen, before AI, we've seen low code and no code solutions saying we no longer need programmers to write code. Um, in the 70s, 80s, 90s, we had case tools or computer aided, aided software engineering. Um, tools like rational rows where you could draw a diagram and then generate the code. I see some nodding. Um, so uh, anecdotally, I was a teaching assistant when I was in university. And one of the classes where I was a teaching as assistant was uh, UML or, or yeah, diagramming and, and think, coming up with the design for your application. And one of the groups that I was uh, a TA for was uh, a group of AI uh, students who would, rather than do, draw the diagram to generate the code, would write the code to generate the diagram. So, uh, you know, doing the thing that they like to do most, uh, which I thought was very funny. Um, but even in the 50s, COBOL was originally invented so that business people could write code. Um, it was intended to be more like English uh, and so that they would need less programmers. But instead, uh, what happened is we needed more programmers to write and maintain the COBOL. And some of the world is still running on COBOL, so that's a great way to make money if you want to learn COBOL. Um, and also in, in Holly's uh, blog post, she mentions that all of these technologies that supposedly would take our jobs or mean that we would need less developers actually increased the demand for developers. Uh, of course, just because that has happened all the, the whole time in the past doesn't mean that that will continue to happen. But so far, that's what's happened. However, our jobs will change. Um, with new tooling, uh, the, how we do our jobs will change. And also, that is not new. I've worked in 
IT for 20, 25 years now. Um, I was a project manager at some, at some point at a bank. Uh, and while I was a project manager there, they went through an agile transformation and decided to get rid of all of the project managers, or most of them anyway. So I had to retrain again as a programmer. I'd learned Java in university, Java 1.2, if you want to do the math on how old I am. Um, <laughs> and then I had to relearn Java, which had improved. Uh, it was Java 8 at that time, uh, which worked out great for me because I got back into programming and turned out I actually like that a lot more than being a project manager. Um, so uh, yeah, during the, the time, my time in IT, I've seen jobs change, job roles change, uh, the way we do our job change. Um, so then the next claim was, will it make us more productive? Um, GitHub have issued a study where they um, recruited 90, 95 developers and split them into two groups to perform a, per a particular task, and one was using Copilot and the other wasn't. They found that the ones that used Copilot were faster at the task, uh, but also note that the task that they gave them to write a web server in JavaScript is a very well-known task. So there should be lots of training material on that, and Copilot should perform well on that because it has all of the training uh, material. Also, according to their uh, research, developers spend a lot of time writing code, um, up to 30%. Uh, and there's lots of research on, on what developers spend their time on, and depending on how you measure it, uh, these results vary because other research um, where they defined coding time as actively writing and editing code in the IDE uh, showed that uh, developers might spend only an hour a day actually writing the code. So even if AI makes you more productive at producing code, if that's only a small part of your day, how much more productive does that make you? Um, we all know that we spend more time reading code than we do writing code. Um, from uh, the book The Programmer's Brain by Feline Hermans, who is a professor of computer science education in the Netherlands. Uh, developers on average spend as much as 58% of their time comprehending existing source code. So if the tools can help you with that, that might make you more productive. Um, and also research from CodeScene shows that the majority of developers' time isn't writing, but understanding and maintaining existing code. So we know, you know, updating dependencies, using new language features. Uh, a lot of our work is maintenance and not writing new stuff. Um, JetBrains have also done a survey on productivity, where again also they, uh, the research shows uh, that developers do save some time. Um, in this uh, research, they are, or in this survey, they didn't give the developers a task, but asked them about their experience with uh, JetBrains AI Assistant. Um, and the survey showed that developers did save some time, but it was distributed how much time uh, people saved. So some saved more, some saved less. Um, they did experience a productivity boost by spending less time searching for information because uh, AI Assistant is available in the IDE. As I'll show you later, you can search for information right there. You don't have to go outside of the IDE and copy paste stuff into ChatGPT. Um, you can use it right there. Um, they experienced the developer experience boost, uh, so reducing cognitive load because it's easier to go search for stuff. Uh, you'll get unblocked faster, and there are some other features that can help you there as well. Um, and what's interesting to me is the top five features that people mentioned uh, were the chat, refactoring and finding problems, explaining code, again, we read more code than we write it, and generating documentation, which is something we know is useful, but don't necessarily like to do. Um, so what I find most interesting here is that this does not include generating code as a favorite feature, because we like to write, write the code ourselves. So I'd like to do a demo of what AI Assistant can do. I'll be using IntelliJ IDEA um, as a Java developer and uh, JetBrains AI Assistant. And I'm using uh, the Spring Pet clinic, clinic as a demo project. Obviously, that's part of the training data, but I've added some additional code as well. 
and I just want to give you an overview of what the features are, and you can think about how that could be useful for you. Um, so first of all, we have an, uh, a chat. Is this visible enough in the back? Yeah? Okay. Um, so in the chat, we can ask uh, different questions like, how do I write a quick sort? Um, obviously, there should be plenty of training data, so it should be able to explain what a quick sort is and to write a, a functioning quick sort. From the chat, we can work with the code. We can copy the code to the clipboard, insert at caret, or create a new file, which since it, cr it created a whole class for us, we could do that and see if it runs. Um, we can also continue the uh, chat, so we could ask whether it could write it in Kotlin, please. You know, let's be um, nice to our AI overlords um, before Skynet happens. Um, so we can continue in the chat uh, as if we're having a conversation and that will be added to the context. Um, because it's integrated into the IDE, it has access to the context of our project. That doesn't mean that it's going to automatically load our entire project into the context but it has access to some information about our project, the same information that the IDE has, for example, to show you the right uh, menus like Graven or Madel, uh, Maven or Gradle, sorry, can't English, um, and other information about your project, like the language, frameworks, dependencies, so that it can use that um, to show you the right menus, etc. cetera. Um, but that means that we can also call back to the uh, IDE to ask to find stuff in our project. Um, and here you'll see that it's, uh, you'll see what it's doing. Uh, and it will go and search the project for the relevant information. So even though you, obviously you can use existing functionality to search your project, but you can also ask AI assistant to go find stuff about your project if you don't know the exact string or how to uh, find it in your code. So from there, we could go to the, where this code is defined. And in the editor, we have predefined um, prompts that we can use. Uh, for example, to explain code. Um, as mentioned, we spend more time reading code than we do writing code. So if you find some code that is unclear, you can ask AI Assistant to explain the code. Obviously, how well it will be able to explain the code depends on how standard your application is. This code is part of its training data, but I have a personal um, Spring demo that I've built, which is also fairly standard. It's, it's perfectly able to understand that as well. Um, So I've added some not so great code in the project. Um, so not to blame the Spring guys for this. Uh, this was added on purpose. So we added some code that is problematic, that has some problems um, to show you that we can use AI Assistant to find problems in the code. Obviously, if you're working with existing code, you might want to make sure that there aren't any problems before you touch the code and now you own it. Um, so in this case, um, there's a risk of infinite loop. That might be useful to know before we touch this code. Um, in addition, we can also uh, ask the AI assistant to suggest refactorings. Um, so we can suggest uh, what refactorings you might want to do. Um, for both of these, it will you, you'll notice it creates a list of things uh, that you might want to fix. Um, always check those lists for what the things are that you actually want to fix right now or not. And then in the chat, you can continue the conversation. Hey, so about that first thing, about the infinite loop, how do we fix that? And the more specific your questions and prompts are, the better the results will be. Uh, not unlike Googling for stuff. Um, Obviously, we can also create, uh, generate code. Let me go to a different class for that. So in the pet validator, um, the pet object is validated. 
Um, so here, um, if we start typing, auto completion might show up. Um, sometimes it takes a while. If we want to, we can also force code completion uh, using a shortcut. Um, and here, this can be useful to come up with additional ideas of validations that you might want to do. Uh, they might be relevant or they might not be relevant. Uh, but it's nice to have sort of like a hyperactive rubber duck that makes suggestions on stuff that you might have missed. Um, alternatively, we might want to um, add specific business logic. So here we can generate code. Uh, for example, ensure pet is not older than 30 years. Um, and it will start to generate a diff if the internet, internet cooperates. Um, so it will generate the code for the specific business logic that we gave it um, as a diff. And here we can either retry if we don't like this code at all, or specify if we want to say um, extract max age as a constant, for example, or any additional prompt that you want to do. It's additional prompts on top of the one that you've already given, much like having the conversation in the chat. Um, or we can accept the code. Uh, you can see that it doesn't automatically generate the uh, imports just yet, but alt enter is your friend. Uh, so you can import the classes using regular functionality. And by the way, we are working on getting it to generate in multiple places so that it will also include the imports. Um, watch this space. So uh, now that we've added some uh, logic, we might want to also generate te some tests. Who likes writing tests? Some of you, thank you, not just me. Yay, for the rest of you, now writing tests is easier, so you have no excuse, thank you. Um, so obviously, when we generate the tests, we do want to double check that the tests work, that they test all of the cases that we want. Um, and especially if you have something that is math heavy, it will generate stuff that looks right, but not, might not necessarily be correct. So make sure that you find your own examples of uh, whatever you're trying to test. And also, um, personal hint, never trust a test that you haven't seen fail. So if a test tests that something works, make sure that it also fails when that doesn't work. Um, much like you want your seatbelt to work in your car. Um, so, sure, let's add. Okay, so sometimes it generates some stuff that isn't correct. Um, I won't try to actively fix this while also talking to you. It's nerve-wracking enough to do a non-deterministic demo. Um, so we'll just ignore that one for now. Let's uh, say we've looked at the tests, we've made sure that they fail if they should, we're testing all of the cases that we want, and we now want to commit uh, the changes that we made to the code. Here we can use AI Assistant to generate a commit message for us. That's obviously something uh, that, is, that an LLM will be good at. It will, it's good at generating a summary of, of what we just did. Um, you might also think, oh, that's way too verbose uh, for me. Um, I'd much rather have a shorter commit message. That's OK. We can edit the prompt and say, use max 10 words and regenerate the commit message. Or if you're using a particular style, or you would like it to write it in Bulgarian, all of that is possible. I'm not sure how good the Bulgarian will be, but I've tried it in Dutch and German, and that works. So now we have a shorter uh, commit message. Uh, there are other ways that we can work with commits. Um, obviously, at some point, we might want to figure out why particular code was changed or what was changed in the code. So we might do a bit of uh, what I call a Git archaeology and go back into the commit history and figure out what happened in a particular commit. Uh, to do so, we can look at the diff for that specific commit and see exactly what was changed, and from there figure out what happened. Uh, but this is, again, something where AI Assistant can help you. It can explain a commit to you. 
So it can again generate a summary of what happened in that commit or in a set of commits. So that can also be useful if you're coming back from holiday and want to see what's been uh, contributed to main, for example. Although don't select all the commits if you want a summary of the project, just ask in the chat. Um, that might be faster. So um, another way that we can uh, use it, if, if we edit the commit message, we can improve the commit message with AI Assistant. So if you're happily working along and committing everything as whip, 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 in the end you can, uh, before you push, uh, improve those commit messages with AI Assistant. So these are things that an LLM should be good at, summarizing uh, what happened. Um, let me think. Uh, another thing that can be super useful, let me quickly start up the, the Spring Pet Clinic. Um, is it can explain runtime errors to you. So, um, kitten and puppy tags from the pet, uh, Spring Pet Clinic. Uh, so, because the Spring Pet Clin Clinic is a demo application. They have an endpoint to trigger an error, which is very useful if you want to show that you can explain this error with AI. Uh, coincidentally, this ruins one of my favorite programming jokes, which is a different error message, progress, uh, because now you can fix the error messages more quickly. But it also means you don't have to go outside of the IDE to Google for that error message uh, to figure out what is wrong. Uh, the predefined prompt here is, please help me understand what the problem is and try to fix it. Of course, in this case, the error is there on purpose, so we don't need to fix it. Um, also, what we can see is, here we can see what has been attached to this prompt, so what has been provided to the context. In this case, it's only one class. Uh, if we're using a different piece of code that has several dependencies, there might be multiple classes uh, that are attached to the context. They don't necessarily need to be open. The context will be gathered for you by AI Assistant. Um, so I think that's most of the features. Um, I forgot to tell, you can't step into the uh, same river twice or same LLM demo because the same it's non-deterministic, so the same prompt might not always give the, the same results. But I did get, fortunately, uh, most of the results that I wanted to show you. Uh, so to give you an overview of the features, we looked at the AI chat, uh, where we can see what is added to the context and continue prompting. I will also um, share a link to the slides at the end, but uh, thanks. Um, we can generate code, explain code, find problems, refactor code, generate tests and documentation. Um, generate and improve commit mes messages and explain commit messages, explain errors. Um, so. I added everything to the slides just in case the internet wouldn't uh, cooperate um, with me. So if you want, you can go through the slides for all of the features that I've showed you. Um, in the meantime, let me skip those because the internet was willing today. So overall, um, I find some of the f these features very useful. Uh, I think they can save you time, uh, especially when writing boilerplate code. Um, they can save you time when typing, when, when auto-completion shows up, and they can help us with tasks that we don't like to do. So for most of you, that's testing, apparently. Um, and it can help you work with existing code. My favorite features are explaining a commit or explaining code over using it to write the code for me. Um, and all of that is really fun, but what about a real-world use case? So uh, my colleague Tagir uh, wrote a, a blog post on using AI Assistant for a task that he regularly does, which is adding inspections to IntelliJ IDEA. Um, he wrote a really fun blog post, I think. He, someone contacted him and said, hey, do we have an inspection for this, that, or the other? And he's like, no, we don't. Let's see if I can use AI Assistant to write one. So he did, and he wrote a blog post about it um, that we wanted to share with you. So you can find that on our blog. And he says, I definitely saved some time here, probably 10 or 20 minutes. That doesn't sound like much, but it was a very small task. 
He said the whole task took about 35 minutes, including creating the U-Track issue and the screenshots for the blog post. So, you know, 10, 20 minutes out of maybe an hour of work uh, that it would have been otherwise. Um, he does uh, say have some uh, caveats. Uh, the main thing is that he says AI assistant cannot learn yet. Maybe in the future it can learn on your code basis as well, but currently it cannot. Um, so some of the things that happened when he was make, creating this inspection was um, having to tell AI assistant, oh, actually we have a new library for this, or um, stuff that if you have a junior that is training on this task, you tell them once and then next time they will know. For AI assistant, that won't be the case. Um, and he says it, they will become more useful in the future. Um, obviously, there are some things that AI is not currently good at, or rather that LLMs uh, cannot do. Uh, one of the things is maths. Uh, if you have something that is math heavy, where you need actual examples of, uh, of values, uh, you, you'll have to actually talk to users or do some research. Uh, one of my colleagues has an example of using photography. Um, uh, calculating uh, how to take the best pictures with the current lighting conditions, so either during the day or during the night. Uh, there's a formula to, to uh, calculate that, but if you want real-world examples, you actually have to go find them, because an LLM is good at um, language, but not at math. So uh, my colleague Jody Birchall also has a video out where she explains what are some of the things that you probably shouldn't be doing with uh, an LLM. Uh, so other things are randomness, although random functions are as great as randomness as well. Uh, timeliness. Um, because the LLMs uh, take a large amount of time and power to train uh, there is a cutoff date, so anything past that date they might not know about. So some of the suggestions might be outdated or simply dated in terms of programming paradigms or styles. So you need to be aware of this if you're using the latest technology, uh, which most of us aren't. I think we do, uh, we do the developer survey every year and I think 50% of developers are still on Java 8. So. For most of you, you'll be fine. For those of you who are lucky enough to be on really recent versions, uh, just be aware that it might not know the latest uh, versions yet. Uh, one other gotcha that I often hear is, haha, but is it secure? Uh, it's been trained on lots and lots of code, which also isn't secure, so there's no guarantee that the code that an AI assistant gives you is secure. So please do check and use scanners and whatnot to make sure that the code you get is secure, much like the code that you and your colleagues write yourself. Um, there is some research about code quality as well. Uh, there was recently a study that said uh, projects that use Copilot actually have more churn, so code that gets added and then uh, changed again. Uh, so that's something to be uh, aware of, especially in that it, we believe that the code generated by an AI assistant is correct or secure uh, when it might not be. And this is something called an automation bias. And that's the propensity for humans to favor suggestions from an automated decision-making system and ignore contradictory information, uh, even if that contradictory information is correct. And I think that that's something that we should all be aware of. Uh, there have been some uh, really well-known examples of automation bias. I don't know if anybody's familiar with the uh, post office scandal in the UK or uh, we had a fun uh, Dutch tax authority thing for the Dutch people, the Toeslagen Affaire, uh, where uh, for the post office scandal people were accused of fraud despite not actually being guilty of fraud because the, al the algorithm, the higher power that is the algorithm, determined that there was fraud going on in their post offices. Um, and the creator of that software for a very long time said that it couldn't be the software, whereas we all know that obviously it can. Uh, so this is something to be aware of. Uh, another thing is that um, it might hallucinate. Uh, I've not had that as much uh, yet because most of the things that I'm doing are 
not really that complicated. Uh, they're fairly straightforward, so there should be lots of training material. But of course, you know, if you're generating algorithms, uh, like my colleague Nikita was doing this morning, it might get it wrong. So uh, be aware of that. Obviously, we're working on preventing that um, and doing studies on how we can prevent that by actively checking the generated code and whether it's correct. Um, so one thing that we are doing is for the extract uh, method refactoring to remove hallucinations, uh, enhance and rank the ones that, uh, that work and leverage the IDE um, to execute them correctly. Um, another concern that we hear about is uh, privacy. The way AI Assistant works is the plugin in the IDE calls the JetBrains AI service. The JetBrains AI service, based on your prompt, determines what the best model is to answer your prompt, which could be a model that we train ourselves or a third-party model. And currently, we use uh, ChatGPT 3.5 and 4, and we'll be adding additional third-party um, models as well. Um, and I know that there are a lot of companies and people who don't want to send their uh, data off to the cloud, even though they are currently, for example, using GitHub or Slack or Google Docs, Google Slides, where they are also putting their um, sensitive business information. So um, just be aware of that. Obviously, we're working on solutions for these things. We've recently um, came out with uh, JetBrains AI Enterprise, where you'll be able to run uh, AI assist assistant on premises so that it, your data doesn't go to the cloud and where we'll also work on cr uh, using custom models trained on your data. And currently you can already use a feature called full line code completion, which is available as of 2024.1 in the commercial uh, IDEs, uh, which will give you some code completion running on a local model. So if you want to use uh, code completion uh, you can use that. Uh, my husband's also a software developer. He mentioned that he finds this extremely useful, for example, when you're adding logging because you're adding lines in multiple places and it just saves a lot of typing. So in the end, do you think it makes us more produ productive? Uh, as mentioned before, I think our jobs will change. I think uh, leveraging these tools can change the way that we our workflow works or uh, the way we approach certain tasks, and I think that there are features that can help make some of our job easier. Um, it's been said that the hottest new programming language is English, because you know if you're if you get really really good at prompting, you can generate all the code. And I've seen conference talks where people do just that; they use only prompts and then generate an application. I don't know that I would want to maintain that application. I think some of you agree with me. Um, so, you know, just to reiterate, make sure that you understand the code that the AI assistant generates for you because you'll have to maintain it. Much like, you know, when you used to copy paste, I mean, for those of who did, copy paste from Stack Overflow, once you commit that code, you own it, you better make sure that you know uh, how it works. Um, so, does AI replace developers currently? It helps us to or it allows us to produce more code faster. Um, which means that there is more code to maintain, which means, well, job security for me, anyway, because um, I don't mind maintaining code. Um, Kevlin uh, Henney said a very true thing that, you know, if we use LLMs to generate lots of code, is we will move ourselves into the role we probably were trying to avoid is creating lots of legacy, legacy code that we'll have to debug and fix. Um, so I think having good scanning tools to check for security issues, um, bug patterns, high RIC and error prone, <laughs> um, bug patterns in your code, and also good developer practices are more important than ever. Um, and our skill sets will need to change and we need to adapt just as we have uh, during the rest of our careers. So TLDR, does it replace developers? I think no, or at least not yet. Thank you.
So if you want to find the slides, you can find them on my website. You can find all my socials there and links to some of the videos and blog posts, etc., that I mentioned are also on the same page. Which leaves me with plenty of time for questions or find me around the conference. I'll be here at least today. I'll have to unfortunately leave tomorrow. Thank you.